Welcome everyone to another Zest Wellness webinar, a part of our Zest Wellness webinar series. We're gonna wait about 30 seconds, just allow everyone to log back on and then we'll get started the presentation. So just wait about 30 seconds here and then we'll get started. All right, everyone, we've, uh, we've hit about 30 seconds here and we have uh, a large number of attendees with us. So what we're gonna do is we are going to um, get started with a quick little intro right now. What we want everyone to kind of get in the mindset of is really taking what we have to say and what Donovan has to say with this presentation and really applying action. So we're trying to get really practical and take action. It's one thing to learn something and for it to go right into our mind, but how can we make it go from our, our mind to our hands and apply action? So in a few moments, we're gonna pose a couple of, uh, of just kind of learning questions to think about during this presentation. The first one being, always think about how can you use this or how can I use this? The second question being, why must I use this? So how can I use this? How must I use this? Because we know reasons reap results. And then thirdly, how can I teach this to someone I love? So we're gonna post these three questions in the, in the chat section. Everyone can just kind of, kind of keep these in mind as you're listening to Donovan to, to help with our, our memory retention. Because as we, just, as we just said, reasons reap results. So how can I use this? Why must I use this? And how can I teach this to someone I love. And so we have a, a phenomenal presentation that Donovan has prepared. And what he's going to focus on is the pillar of nutrition. He's going to take us through lifestyle assessments. He's going to bust some nutrition myths. He's also going to get real practical when it comes to grocery shopping. And he's also going, he's then going to uh, finalize the presentation, bringing up this whole talk about culture and how that connects with, with food and with nutrition. So Donovan's going to cover a number of really interesting topics for us to once again get at that practical action part. As everyone knows, to enroll in our wellness program, and we'll put this website link below, it is joinzestwellness.com. So if you haven't enrolled yet, you can do so at once again, joinzestwellness.com. To move into the presentation now, we're going to introduce uh, Donovan Ingram. And Donovan, can you just say hi to everyone so they can know what your voice sounds like? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Fantastic. Thank you, Donovan. And what we're going to just go to right now is we're going to introduce Ali Carson, who deals with all of Zest Wellness's marketing. And she's going to give us a nice scoop on what we can expect from all of our different social media platforms and marketing tools. Hi everyone, this is Ali. We are getting all over social media these days. So if you are listening to this webinar and you're like, wow, I really love what Zest Wellness has to say and where can I get more? You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And on there, you're gonna find wellness tips, nutrition information, healthy lifestyle motivation, um, nice quotes, and then also updates and events uh, for Zest Wellness. So take a look and make sure you follow us on those channels. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ali. Now to Thanks, bring Steve. in, you're welcome. To bring in Donovan back into the presentation now, we actually asked Donovan three very serious questions about nutrition <laughs> and about himself. The first serious question we asked him is, what is his favorite food? His response was actually potato chips which is why he actually made a statement of he intentionally tries to avoid 
that section in the grocery store because he knows if he walks down that section, he knows what he's going to be purchasing. So it's funny how John, you 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 have this this desire for for potato chips. Um, yeah, we all have bad habits, right? <laughs> all right. Um, a nice fun fact, um, if anyone wants to also learn about Donovan, is that he's a, a, a huge fan of tennis. And in terms of nutrition and kind of, a, you know, if you could say one sentence about nutrition, it's that always remember to outweigh your good nutrition habits with the bad nutrition habits. Perfection is what we're aiming for, but we're aiming to outweigh our good habits from our bad habits. So, Donovan, right now is I will give you presenter rights and you can start sharing your presentation with us. All right. So, Nathan, thank you for having me for this webinar today. And I'm, I'm very grateful to everyone that's joined the webinar today. And Nathan, can you see my screen? Nathan, can you see my screen? Yep, you're gonna go back to the third slide and we can see you, perfect. So it's all yours, Donovan. Okay, awesome. So I would be remiss if I didn't start the presentation by giving you some background information as to why wellness is important worldwide and also why um, understanding um, nutrition a little bit more closely is important to all of us as global um, citizens. Um, um, forgive me that the, the um, statistics are primarily based on the Bahamas, but I'm using the Bahamas as a, a um, representation of all Caribbean countries which this webinar should be reaching. But the World Health Organization has identified, and this was um, published in 2008, that the, the crisis as it relates to the Bahamas, um, there are 74% of deaths related to non-communicable diseases. That's hypertension, that's cardiovascular disease, that's cancer, and even diabetes. And with that, the world population, the World Health Organization has, has, has get us to understand that the world population is increasingly becoming more and more obese year by year, with no slowdown in this number kind of coming to a, a halt. Now, back in 2012, the World Health Organization has identified that in the Bahamas, some 79.2% of individuals were considered overweight or obese. And that's a big issue because we know the larger the individual, the more at risk they are for chronic diseases. Um, and again, in 2013, they did a, a study on children. And what they, understood, what they found from the study was that some 45.7% of children between the ages of 13 and 15 were either were considered overweight and another 21% were considered obese. That means that over 60, 66% of the Bahamian population as it relates to the adolescent individuals were considered at risk for chronic diseases. So we need to be, be, be very mindful for this in our Caribbean countries. Um, what was most alarming for me as a nutritionist was that um, the World Health Organization actually came back and reported that 83.4% of kids had admitted that they had consumed fewer than five fruits and vegetables per day. And one of my conversations today is to encourage persons to consume fruits and vegetables, but not only consume fruits and vegetables, but to meet the World Health Organization daily recommendation, which is to consume five to six servings of fruits and vegetables per day. So we need to pay attention to these statistics. We need to pay attention to the statistics as it relates to uh, the adult population. But most importantly, we need to pay attention to it as it relates to the childhood population because we're finding that chronic diseases and also obesity is becoming an epidemic. Now, we have to understand that in order to see change in these statistics, we have to embark on lifestyle changes. And the only way we can embark on lifestyle changes is by creating small habits. And remember, small habits create big changes. Now, habit, by definition, is an acquired behavior, a behavioral pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary, meaning that you are, you're doing something so consistently that you, it's second nature to you, that it's ingrained in your in your day-to-day -day routine. Now, we have to create habits and positive habits 
because habits can nurture our health. In fact, Dr. Deepak Chopra went on record, and, and, I, and as I quote him, he said that the mind, the body, our emotions, our relationships, our sensory experiences like sound, touch, smell, and taste are all windows to our inner pharmacy. What this means is that we all have the capabilities of changing our health outcome by channeling good mental and good spiritual health. We have to focus on the inside of what's going on inside of us, create those habits of focusing on ourselves a little bit more, and by doing that, the external, the, the physical part of our lives will all be influenced. In fact, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, the Honorable Margaret Thatcher, former pri Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, she's been quoted in saying that, watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. At no point do we want to leave this earth and uh, look back at, at our lives and not see a sense of self that we try to improve on our health. And in creating, creating great character or a great destiny, we have to create small habits today that are gonna be consistent tomorrow. In fact, if I use myself as, as an example, um, I, I, I go on the record and say that every time I brush my teeth, I tend to run the water on the tap knowing that the world is in a water shortage. Uh, and sadly, I tend to forget, I'm sorry, I tend to forget that the water is running, um, but the minute I am aware that the water is still running, I immediately turn it off. And that consciousness of remembering that you're doing something bad is, is good because it, it, it's a trigger that's going to promote positive new habits that you're going to be consistently aware of. Um, again, I'm sorry, that's a bad habit, but identifying bad habits are a very important part of making a big change in your lifestyle. Now, Dr. B.J. Dr. BJ Fogg, he is a professor at Stanford University, and um, the Zest team are, are very familiar with Dr. Fogg's presentations because we, we tend to encounter him at our, our Thrive conferences when we go to the Virgin Pulse Thrive conference each year. And Dr. Fogg created the Fogg Behavioral Model. And I think this model is very helpful, helpful in, in, in getting us to understand ways in which we can create great habits or good habits. But the theory is that you have to be both motivated and you have to be able. Now, let's just say our, uh, our new habit that we're trying to form is drinking more water. In order for us to consume more water, we have to be motivated, meaning that we have to want water. We have to be conscious of it. We have to be aware of our lack of water consumption or aware of how much water we're consuming. But also, we have to be able. The ability has to be great, meaning that water has to be present. It has to be available, whether at home, at work, in the office space, in the kitchen. It has to be present. If you're not motivated, the, the trigger to create this new habit is not going to happen. Also, if you're not able to trigger to create this habit, it's not going to happen. In fact, to, to set yourself up to succeed, to create this new habit, Dr. Fogg's behavioral th theory tells us that the individual has to be motivated. There has to be a high level of motivation, and there also has to be a high level of ability. Now, I say all this to say that a lot of times, the, the possibilities of being motivated and both able are not always likely, but we have to create avenues where the ability or the motivation is somewhat capable or reachable. And if we're not, then we're not setting ourselves up to succeed. So be, a, be, a, be aware of this as you're creating new goals. Um, this is a new year of 2019. As you are, are embarking on these new lifestyle journeys or continuing a lifestyle journey from last year, be aware of these new habits that you're trying to form. But remember to always set yourself up to succeed by always providing high motivation and making yourself completely able. 
Now, let's do a quick lifestyle assessment for those that are listening. And uh, the rules of this assessment are quite simple. You have to give, rule number one, you have to give a yes or no definitively to each of the questions listed. Second rule, you have, if you answer four yeses to any of these questions, then you are deemed a healthy individual. If you answer four no's to, to all of these questions, well, to several of these questions, then that means you are considered an unhealthy individual. And then rule number four, if you answer three yeses, that means your lifestyle is stable, but near critical, okay? So let's go through the uh, lifestyle assessment together. We'll answer in our minds or out loud, if you feel so, and determine what type of lifestyle we are living. First question, do you eat fruits and veg at every meal? Do you consume a minimum eight glasses of water every two to three hours every day? Do you exercise a minimum four times per week? Do you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same times every day without missing a meal? And now last question, do you consider exercise and healthy eating very important for your lifestyle? Now, for those of you that may have answered yes to four questions, you're, you're a healthy individual, and we compliment you. We encourage you to continue on. Those of you who may have answered um, no to four questions, don't be, don't be set back. Don't be, um, don't be discouraged. I, I hope that this is a form of encouragement for you because as a quote at the bottom of the screen says, the worst day is the first day. Press the reset button if you have to. Um, get past the first day. Stay in it and never get out of it. So we encourage you to press on. Use this understanding of this assessment to help you understand where you are now and as motivation for you to become better with your life. Let's improve on your lifestyle by getting a bit more familiar with your well-being. Now, in understanding oneself, we have to understand what goes into our health. In fact, there are many factors that affect our health. There are those socioeconomic factors, that's education, your job status or job title, your family, friends, your social environment, and even your income and the community in which you live in terms of if it's safe or not. Then there's the physical environment. It's the, the, the amount of buildings that you're surrounded by, the climate, um, are, are there green spaces nearby, is it more traffic, is it congested? Those environments are very effect, efficient in affecting our, uh, our overall health. Then the third aspect is the health behaviors. That's, do you smoke tobacco? Do you eat fruits and vegetables? Do you exercise? Do you consume alcohol? How much alcohol are you consuming? And then there's the sexual activity that's also a factor. But uh, the last uh, factor that's also influential to our health is getting regular health care, doing your annual physicals, um, going and seeing, seeing a doctor, even as simple as sitting with a nutritionist one-on-one, -on -one, once per year. Those type of habits will encourage uh, a proper or uh, a positive well-being. But what we understand most, most importantly from all these aspects that go into our health is that the socioeconomic factors are the most effective in terms of changing our health. That's 40% of our overall health. Uh, in fact, there was a study that shows that um, over a period of uh, a person's lifetime, the average attempt for weight loss was about five to three attempts in a lifetime. But for women, the attempts were seven attempts per lifetime. Now, I can't say why women choose to embark on um, these new journeys or start over or try to lose weight so, so much more than men. But what I can speak to is that the possibilities of why the women are choosing to embark on weight loss more frequently is because they're not identifying with their socioeconomic factors, those factors that may encourage bad habits or those, um, or those factors that would, could promote good habits, but they're not utilizing well enough. So we really want to encourage you to focus a lot more on your socioeconomic factors. In fact, Dr. Deepak Chopra also commented and said that our socioeconomic factors, the people we spend time with, the communities we embrace, the organizations we are, are surrounded by, the people we are affiliated with, even our jobs, 
really do determine the type of person we are. And in fact, we need to uh, relate with these factors a little bit more closely. And you need to cut off the habits or cut off the relationships that are not making you better and embark on trying to reassociate yourself with positive environments, positive environments that are going to allow your well-being to flourish. Now, it's very important that you invest in your mind, invest in your health, and invest in yourself. Do you take a moment to even look in the mirror? Uh, I, I like the cartoon character on the left side of the screen. It's a lady looking at, in the mirror first thing in the morning. I know for most of us, it's not always a glorious sight, but it's important that not only, not just in the mornings when we get ready for work or in the evenings, all through the day, any opportunity, you have to take a moment to look in the mirror. If you need to take off all your clothing to look in the mirror, then do that. We need to figure out what physically is changing in our bodies. A lot of times we're going through physiological changes in terms of weight gain, uh, weight gains, and we're not focused on it until it becomes a severe problem. So I encourage you, take every moment of every part of your life to reassess yourself when you look in the mirror. Look at, uh, look at the things that are changing. Look at the physiological changes. And you know what? In truth, be honest with yourself. Take that moment to, to look at yourself and be honest. Are you consuming the right foods? Are you committing to exercise like you should? Are you trying to reduce your stress levels? Are you really trying to do these things? And be honest with yourself in that moment. In fact, George B um, Bal Balakine uh, went on record and said that the mirror is not you. The mirror is you looking at yourself. It's the same person in the mirror. But we have to have these conversations. Like Michael Jackson says, it, it's the man in the mirror. Uh, you, have to, you, have to, you have to do this on a regular basis because these are the ways in which you can trigger that mental and spiritual changes to, to affect positive well-being. And don't be afraid to look in the mirror. I know people may think of it as vanity, but in fact, there's a quote that says, loving yourself isn't vanity, it's sanity. Now, very difficult conversation. I'm sorry if I'm going to gross anyone out. I know it's after lunch, before lunch, during lunchtime. But let's have a conversation about monitoring your poop. Um, we go to the restroom. Um, I'm hopeful that everyone goes to the restroom and, 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 and poops at least once a day. But in fact, you should be defecating immediately after consuming a meal. That's a natural way of doing it. And some persons just want today. It should be several times a day, in fact. Because everything we consume is eventually going to develop into to feces or into to waste. And we want to take a moment that when the, the waste product has been, has been discharged to analyze the things that we are putting into our body. Look at the poop. Look at it. Is it floating? Is it sinking? What's the, what's the texture of it? Is it watery? Is it solid? Is it, um, what color is it going? Is, is it giving off? And also the, even the smell. And, and understanding these things, we'll understand foods that are very beneficial to our health and we'll replicate those habits more, more regularly. So the next time you go to the restroom, take a moment, analyze your poop, and tell yourselves, are you eating the right foods? Now let's go into a more sane conversation. <laughs> this conversation is, is primarily about daily fruits and vegetable consumption. Now, the World Health Organization recommends that we, we consume five to six servings of fruits and veg per day. And you would have noticed from one of my first slides that the statistics in the Bahamas, um, not enough of our kids are eating fruits and veg. So this is something we as adults and also we as kids or our kids need to improve upon. Now, the reason why the World Health Organization recommends five to six servings of fruits and veg per day is because of the antioxidants it provides. And that's a very, 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 very helpful nutrient to suppress weight gains, but most importantly, it suppresses the onset of chronic diseases, that's hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, even cancer. Now, by definition, the word antioxidant is a chemical compound or substance that inhibits oxidation. And it sounds a little complex still, 
forgive me, but in fact, we want to inhibit oxidation because oxidation happens at the cell level of our life. And for those of you who may have never done health or, or basic science, the cell is considered the basic unit of life. And in fact, cells form tissues, tissues form, forms organs, Organs forms the system, so that's the digestive system, the skeletal system, the respiratory systems, the rest of those systems in collaboration. But all these various systems work together to form the organism. And myself, I'm an organism. Each and every one of you are an organism. And our basic level of life is the cell. When oxidation happens, and those are um, um, radicals entering our bodies that try to destroy our cells, those cells manipulate other cells to create cancers or toxins in our bodies. So we need an overwhelming amount of antioxidants on a daily basis, again, five to six servings of fruits and veg, to counteract the effects of oxidation. Now you may ask, how do we do this? We have to do this by eating those fruits and vegetables regularly. But remember, Man cannot survive on green leafy vegetables alone. In fact, we should follow the suggestions put to us by the infamous Mrs. Michelle Obama. And she recommends the portion plate. It's been revamped to take the place of the food pyramid simply because the food pyramid was not as explanatory for individuals to grasp. But the portion plate is very simple. It tells us that this is the way we should be eating at every meal. This is how we establish these lifestyle changes. This is the habit we should take on every day. The portion plate tells us that half of the plate, 50% of that plate, should be a portion of fruit with vegetable. 25% of that plate should be high fiber carbohydrates. Another 25% of that plate should be lean protein sources. But we have to consume this ratio of 50, 25, 25% on a daily basis at every meal, not missing a meal. That's at breakfast, again at lunch, and at dinner, again, not missing a meal. But in order for us to execute this portion plate or these lifestyle changes by habit, we have to create a second habit or a, 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 a habit before the, the, this habit is actually established. And that's simply by writing a grocery shopping list. Uh, a lot of times we get to the grocery store, we are confused on what to buy, and we overspend, or we buy items and we don't have everything we need for our meals. We have to start planning. Create that as your habit. Plan your meals ahead of the week. Think about what you're going to eat tomorrow before tomorrow comes. So I encourage you, write a grocery shopping list, Make it a habit, and come on, let's try it. I know you'll benefit from it, okay? Now, when we talk about fruits and vegetables, uh, as a nutritionist, one of the major concerns I'm always getting is, should I eat this fruit or should I eat that fruit? I'm here to tell you that, in truth, you eat any fruit. Any fruit once it's off the portion size. Take a moment with me. Ball a fist, look at it, look at the size of that fist. That fist tells you the amount of fruit, maximum amount of fruit you should be consuming at every meal. And remember we said in the portion plate is a 50, 25, 25 ratio. That's a portion of fruit at breakfast. Again, another portion of fruit, that fist, another portion of fruit at lunch. And thirdly, again, that fist is another portion of fruit, again, at dinner. But please do not miss meals. We'll talk about that later on and why that's so important. Again, another question I'm always getting is, why are solids so boring when I want to eat healthy? Solids don't always have to be boring. I think a lot of times we get stuck in a rut thinking a salad is simply a Caesar salad or a vegetable salad, and we're not being very creative. So the, 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 the image to the right of the, the slot of the screen helps us to understand how to build the perfect salad. First thing you want to do is pick a green leafy veg, you can pick one or two or three or four, and that's iceberg lettuce, romaine, spinach, um, arugula, radishes, even uh, um, leeks if, you, if, if necessary. Then you want to add a cup of color, and that's green peppers, red peppers, carrots, beetroots, even um, pomegranate seeds, 
strawberries, radishes, just to give it a little bit more jazziness. Then you want to add some crunch, and that crunch can take the form of our whole grains. Remember we said that 25% of the place should be high fiber sources, and high fiber sources can be any form of legume, that's nuts or seeds, um, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, pine nuts, walnuts, almonds, even hemp seeds or sliced almonds. But to complete that meal, to go back to that portion plate, that 50, 25, 25 ratio, we need protein. And we have to ensure that protein is also present when building that salad. And that can come from our grilled meats like chicken and fish, even tofu or shrimp or prawns like the British tends to re relate it to. But sadly, um, a lot of us tend to forget a very important aspect of the salad, or sometimes you overindulge in this aspect of the salad, and that's the salad dressing. I would encourage you to make your own salad dressing using an extra, extra, extra virgin olive oil base and adding things like balsamic vinegar, lemon, or, or um, honey mustard just to blend the different variations of vinaigrettes together. So again, pick the greens, add some color, then add the crunch from whole grains, add some proteins, and top it with your homemade vinaigrette. It's very easy. Now, another conversation I, I tend to get as a nutritionist is, aren't carbohydrates bad for you? Don't they make you fat? In fact, the, the issue with carbohydrates is that we're consuming the wrong forms of carbohydrates, or whole grains. And if you look at the image to the left, it tells us that the difference between a whole grain versus a white grain. So that's the whole wheat bread versus the white bread, or the whole grain rice versus the white rice. And in fact, the whole grain items, what makes them very healthy or helpful in our health is the fact that the bran and the germ is still very much intact. When our carbohydrates goes through the refining process, the bran and the grain and the germ, sorry, are extracted. We don't want those forms. And if you look at the image to the right, we'll see how the refined grains actually affects our blood sugar levels because they can affect our glycemic index. And for those of you who don't know what glycemic index means, it means how quickly foods cause our blood sugar levels to rise. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Now, if you look at the, the image to the, to the right, we'll notice that foods are causes our blood sugar levels to go the, the increase in, in capacity very quickly are uh, things that we know about for us, potato chips, biscuits, ice cream, even jasmine rice, and processed foods. So let's be careful of those items. But foods that are always going to allow our bodies to regulate the blood sugar levels better are going to be basmati rice, vegetables, our, our legumes like lentils, and even pasta, whole grain breads, oranges, even oatmeal. So it is important that we choose foods that are going to have a, a lower response and blood sugar value because it's going to allow our metabolic process to work faster or better. And we want this because you have to think of sugars as a bunch of persons trying to enter a huge stadium. If lots of persons are trying to enter a stadium chaotically without a line, it's going to cause confusion. It's going to be chaos and noise everywhere. And that's when we eat those bad foods. In fact, when we eat those good foods, it's like persons entering a, a stadium, but they're orderly. They're in a line. They have their tickets ready. There's persons to receive them. That means that the, the sugars are being received and utilized in a very efficient manner and not a chaotic manner. And that's very helpful for persons who may be at risk or have heart disease, who may be at risk or have diabetes. But most importantly, it's for individuals who simply want to establish weight loss. Now, when deciding foods, we have to be careful of two things. We have to be careful of the nutrition label on every food item we consume. And secondly, we have to be understanding of where these foods are actually coming from. So when you read the label, always start at the very top. Understand the serving size first. But beyond the serving size, those daily values are very important. Know that 5% or less of a daily value is considered low, whereas 20% or more of the daily value is considered high. So 5% or less is like a green on a traffic light. It means go. It's very good for you. Anywhere between 6 to 19% daily value is like yellow on a traffic light. It means caution, slow down, approaching high. 
And anything with a daily value of 20% or more, it is high, that's red on a traffic light, and we all know red on a traffic light means stop, you are in a warning zone, okay? Now, when understanding where the foods are coming from, we have to understand these things. And it's simple, when, when you get produce, at the grocery store, most times they have a little sticker on it. It'll tell you exactly which country it, it has come from. And it even can tell you or indicate whether the item is organic or not. So pay attention to those things when you go to the grocery store. But know that foods are only produced in two ways, uh, two areas. They're pr produced from fishing vessels or on a farm. And in fact, when you leave the fishing vessel or the farm, they go into processing. That's where those additives and, and preservatives may be added. And, and then they move into distribution where they are in warehouses. From distribution, it goes to either a restaurant or a retail store. That's one of your grocery stores, even your farmer's market. And from the retail store, it can end up at home to be prepared. And then on the dinner table, and for the restaurant, it ends up in a chef's kitchen for preparation and then at the dinner table at the restaurant. But I want you to know from production to consumption, this process is usually about two to three weeks and a lot of times, the nutrients we think we're consuming have already been lost. So with this, it's very efficient for us to become a little bit more self-efficient by producing our own forms of food, if we can, and creating our own farmer's markets, food for thought. But it's no pressure on you to do those things. I only ask you, read the nutrition labels and understand where your food is coming from. Let's start with that. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't start or I didn't give a conversation about water consumption. In fact, we should be documenting the amount of water we are consuming. And when you're realizing that you're not consumed enough, if you're listening to me right now and you have not had water yet for the day, grab a cup of water right now. Now, in fact, a lot of us always think that based on a lot of recommendations, we should be consuming eight glasses of water safely, right? But I want to let you know that, in fact, that habit of consuming eight is not sufficient sometimes. In fact, for a person of my weight, 180 pounds, look at, looking at the middle image, a person of my weight of 180 pounds, we should be consuming around 90 ounces. And 90 ounces equivalates to about 11 and a half glasses of water. And those five bottles is recommending, those bottles are in 16 ounce measurements. So technically, I should be eating, drinking sorry, 11 or more 8-ounce cups of water per day. And we all know water is very, very helpful for us. And in fact, if you want to know exactly how much water you should be consuming, look at the middle chart, measure your weight, and understand the amount of water you should be consuming on a daily basis. But we know water is beneficial for immunity. It helps you feel and look better and younger. It helps with the kidneys gives you energy, improves digestion, gives you a better muscular re uh, relief or response, and also improves circulation. So food for thought, water is very important. In fact, there was a research study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism back in 2003. And the lead writer on this, on this research study was Michael Boschman. And what they determined that was that by drinking 500 milliliters, and 500 milliliters, for those who don't know milliliters to, to glasses or cups of water, 500 milliliters is actually two cups of eight ounces of water. By drinking two cups of water a day, it, well, drinking two cups of water increases your metabolic rate by 30%. And we know our metabolic rate drives our weight loss process, but it also drives our reduction in chronic diseases. So, Food for thought, you need to be consuming water because it, it helps to speed up your metabolism, but it also helps to reach the highest level your metabolism can reach within 30 minutes. So you should be drinking those water, that water with your meals so that your body is able to digest and disseminate the nutrients that you're consuming from the food. In fact, the research also went further to say that the, the fact of thermogenesis or increased metabolism is better established when the water is warmed from 20 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius, meaning um, instead of drinking room temperature or cold water, we should be consuming some forms of teas on a regular basis or hot water. 
So um, like the Asians do, have a cup of water with every meal. Now, there are many factors that cause stress. And one of the major factors that cause, well, there are many factors that cause obesity, and stress is one of those factors that cause obesity. But one of the reasons why persons get obese, become obese through, through stress, is not just the, the stress alone, but it's the fact that the stress leads us to make bad choices. Uh, I like the cartoon character on the left because it's a lady meeting with her doctor, and the doctor says to her, when you're stressed, it's okay to have one glass of wine. The lady responds, every 10 minutes? I know, this is a joke, we joke, we kid, we kid. But in fact, a lot of persons make this a habit. Every time they get stressed, they go for a bad habit or they reach for a bad habit, whether it be alcohol, sometimes it's food, and it can be other habits. But I want you to be cognitive of you consuming these bad habits or, or going to these bad habits when you regularly do. Let's try to create positive outcomes. And if alcohol has to be your bad habit, I understand that the World Health Organization recommends that a male should limit his alcohol consumption to two beverages per day, and a female should always limit her alcohol consumption to one alcohol beverage per day. Now, you also need to understand the volume when it comes to different sorts of alcohol consumptions. For bear, that's usually 12 ounces. For malted liquors, that's about eight to nine ounces. For wine, it's not the entire bottle in a large glass. It's actually just five ounces. And for spirits, it's 1.5 ounce. So understand what is the serving size of the alcohol based on the type of alcohol you like, but limit the amount you're supposed to have. Again, male are limited to two servings per day, and women are limited to one serving of alcohol per day. Now, there are uh, there are a whole lot of factors that cause obesity. And I, I like this this um, this cartoon character because it, it gives a little funny synopsis of what I think a lot of us experience when, we, when we're deciding what it is we want to eat. Uh, a gentleman walks, to, walks into a restaurant, sits down, the waitress comes up, and he says, I'll have the garden salad, please. And, and, and his mind and his stomach is telling him, we'll have the cheeseburger and fries instead, you know? Uh, a lot of times we think we want to eat healthy, but our bodies are telling us that we, we want something else. We have to ignore these bad influences that come from inside us. And I want you to understand that you have to be able to make these type of cognitive decisions on your own. It's also very important for you to understand your body type. There are three different types of body types. There are the ectomorphs, these are the slender individuals you may see in your office space or your family members. They would have longer limbs, um, narrowed waist, long legs, long arms, very narrowed uh, features in the face. Then there, there are those mesomorphs, which you may also see in your office space or in your family. And uh, these mesomorphs, uh, I consider myself a mesomorph because we are the athletic individuals, muscular physique, a little bit of tone and definition, no source of um, no 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 sense of um, high fat volume in the body, very minimal fat um, um, outlook. But then there's also the endomorph. And sadly, for Caribbean countries, the majority of individuals in these populations are considered endomorph. And this is something we have to pay attention to for ourselves, but also as a society, because the endomorphs are those rounded individuals. They have more of a distended stomach. They carry a lot more weight in the, in the arms, in the chest area, in the hips, in the thighs. And in fact, these individuals, the endomorphs, are highest at risk of chronic diseases because they are already considered either overweight or obese. And in reality, remember, body transformation doesn't happen overnight. So give yourself some time, all right? Set a goal, create a habit, but give yourself some time. Now, in order for us to really, really embark on true lifestyle changes by Im positively improving our well being, we have to create hobbies. A lot of times, we have to use exercise as a hobby, whether it's a hobby that you do before work, during work, after work. Um, we need to get back into recreational sports. I think a recreational sports is an easy way of getting fitness into our regular routine. As we previously indicated, you should be exercising at least four times per week. Even if it's group Tai Chi for the elderly, um, yoga classes, 
Gardening is also a great form of exercise, but we have to influence these changes now, and we have to influence our kids to understand the importance of exercise. Remember, you are each other's keeper. Get a friend, a colleague, a family member. Get them to come out with you. Get that support. But build that type of relationship with someone so that you can stay committed. And remember, consistency will make you smile when you look in that mirror. Now, one of the last aspects of this webinar that I wanted to touch on as it relates to habits and the snowball effect is culture. Because I feel that culture is a very big driving force to an individual's conception of who they are and what they want out of life. In fact, culture is defined as the sum of attitudes, customs, and belief that beliefs, sorry, that distinguishes one group of people from another. So each of us from different countries have an overlap in culture in some capacities, but we all have our roots that drive us culturally. And one of the major important things to know is that culture drives health. There are countries in Europe and um, East Asia and um, central, the central part of the world, even the southern part of the world, that are considered to have a longer life expectancy. And that's simply because of the habits they're, they're embarking on. If we look at um, France, for instance, it has a life expectancy of 81, 81 years on average. Um, these are the type of persons that, that these things are, are natural to them. They are consistently encouraging um, organic produce and, and fresh ingredients into anything they prepare. They are um, consumers of wine. And like most European countries, they get a lot of walking and a lot of mobility. In Italy, it's a Mediterranean-rich diet, and they consume foods that are high in omega-3s because they're consuming a lot of olive oil. Um, for Australia, with a life expectancy of 81.9, uh, these individuals are more self-reliant. They are creating their own foods. They, they, they are more productive when it comes to produce for themselves. And in fact, naturally, um, exercise is a normal thing for them. They're very active individuals. They like to go surfing, they go swimming, they play rugby, hiking, or even biking. In Switzerland, one of the richest countries in the world, the life expectancy is 82.28. And that's because they exercise all year round. So in the wintertime, they find winter sports to embark on. And then in the summertime, they find summer sports to embark on. So sport, sporting life is a natural thing in that culture. In Spain, uh, the life expectancy is 83.12. These individuals tend to adapt to tapas, and tapas, as we know, are smaller portion sizes, and they're not over consumers of foods. They try to try as many different types of foods in one sitting, but then they're not over consuming. They're very attentive to the portion size on their plate. In Japan, their life expectancy is 84.19, and that can be attributed uh, to the, the types of foods they're consuming. But we know a lot of Asian com countries like Japan and Asia, and sorry, and China, they consume a lot of green teas, and green tea is a, a big staple when it comes to every meal. It's consumed with every meal, and that can be a driving force for why these countries are, uh, well, that country is expecting a higher life expectancy. Then in Monaco, Monaco sorry, um, the life expectancy is 89.63, and these, this country is considered one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Yeah, and that can be a major factor. Um, something we may have not um, taken into, into account when um, putting this chart together is the healthcare systems in these countries. But one has to think that beyond the healthcare systems, beyond how rich these countries are, we, we have to think that some wellness aspect is driving persons to live longer. And for us individuals in the Caribbean, we have to adapt to a culture or we have to modify our culture to suit a longer life expectancy. And that starts with each and every one of us. Now, when understanding life expectancy, uh, when understanding healthy environments, we have to be very attentive to food marketing because food marketing plays a big deal when it comes to improving our health or the types of foods we choose. In fact, there's a nutritionist that went on record to say that um, um, we are not driven, we, we are not always conscious 
of the food choices we're making, and we think we're making these food choices on our own, when in fact, that commercial you would have heard on the radio, or something you would have seen on the television, or some billboard that has the biggest, juiciest hamburger and french fries, those are the driving forces that make us choose certain foods that are not good for us. So we have to be aware of these things. And we also have to be aware of how food marketing influences the, the decision of our children, because a lot of food marketing is driven to, to, to take advantage of children and to change their mindset of what is healthy versus unhealthy. And in fact, last year, um, the food industry made some $1.8 billion, well, sorry, they spent $1.8 billion simply aimed at children and teens alone. And of that marketing, that $1.8 million, $1.8 billion spent, only 1% or less was driven towards food and fresh, fresh vegetables and fruits consumption, whereas 51% of that $1.8 billion was to advertise sugar, sugar drinks, sugary cereals, and sweets and snacks. So pay attention to all of this. Now, I'll end with a simple quote that says, the pain of discipline is nothing like the pain of disappointment. So set yourself up to succeed, create new habits, but most importantly, be consistent with these good habits. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And if you have any questions for us, please shout them out now. I think Nathan's going to join us. Nathan, you here? I am here, Donovan. Thank you. That was... Uh... I know for myself, I 100% enjoyed that. And um, as we wait for any questions to come in right now, um, we do have a, 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 a two questions that have been kind of primed for this. One of them is because it was such a, a really interesting topic you brought up. But if you don't mind kind of reiterating to everyone, when you were talking about portion sizes and someone's fist, if you can just kind of maybe explain that again, because it sounds like such a, a practical and important um, takeaway from this session yeah and i think a lot of persons don't understand the right portion sizes and our portion size is actually relevant to us as an individual so again take your fist your fist would be a different size from a colleague's fist or a family member's fist a kid or a female versus a male so understanding your fist size and, and balling that fist tells you the portion size of fruit you should be consuming now, it may get a little complex trying to remember all these different things, but remember that the bigger the fist, the more foods you're allowed to consume. So a, a gentleman that has a bigger fist than my fist, he'd be able to eat more fruits than I would be allowed per serving. So stick to the portion plate. And remember, the portion plate is 50% of the plate should be fruit with veg or half a plate of veg. 25% of the plate should be high fiber sources and 25% of that plate should be lean protein sources. And that should be on an eight inch plate from end to end. Fantastic, Donovan. Uh, we got a question here asking um, about school. Okay, it's about, about students, why not? Do you recommend a healthy snack option for parents and their students? What can students, I suppose, what can it looks like, what can they bring for their lunches? That's a, a healthy, or sorry, with for snacks, that's a healthy alternative. Well, one of the biggest recommendations for school kids is to get them to consume more sources of fruits and vegetables. So mixing up the variety of fruits and vegetables they consume is one form of um, snack recommendation, but uh, the alternatives are all legumes. Um, I, and I think as a, society in the Bahamas, but I think Caribbean based, a lot of us are not consuming enough legumes and that's our nuts, that's um, peanuts. Um, and and then these are, uh, that's if you don't have an al allergy to these items, that's peanuts, walnuts, pine nuts, even um, almonds, um, even consuming beans, uh, making some purees, carrot sticks and hummus, carrot sticks and um, pesto sauce. So getting kind of creative with fruits and vegetables, whether eating them whole or blending them down, and also factoring those legumes are very effective in creating snacks for school kids. And make it colorful. Cool. Um, we, have, we had a couple of kind of logistical questions. Um, someone asking about, we do these webinars about once a quarter, 
and this webinar was also recorded. So this webinar will be posted on our Zest Wellness YouTube page. So you can uh, you can view this webinar anytime and share it with, with anyone you would like to as well. Um, we have a question here. Okay, uh, Jonathan, can you clarify when you mentioned about water, metabolic rate, and fat? I suppose maybe they mean they mean burning fat, but maybe they mean clarifying the the connection between how is water and burning fat. How is that? How should we how should we learn that, and why is that important? Certainly. So um, the chart that I showed before got, got us to understand uh, our weight, and based on your weight, the amount of water you should be consuming. Now, for me, and I'm using myself as a reference because I can't remember the entire chart. Um, my weight is around 180 pounds which means I need to be consuming 11 or more glasses of water, and that's eight ounces of water per day. And the way water works is it speeds up our metabolism. And that research study that I, I spoke about by uh, Mr. Botchman, and I was published in the, in the Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, um, the this, this study proves what I'm trying to get you to understand. And that's that by drinking water, it actually causes your metabolism to speed up. The reason why is because our blood drives our metabolism and the pressure in which blood moves around the body also is a factor on determining what your metabolic rate is. And we all know blood is majorly, com um, uh, the component of blood is water. So if we are dehydrated, then the blood pressure and the movement of blood is gonna be less. We always want to improve on blood flow, making sure the blood from one area to the body to the next is moving efficiently and fast, and that means our metabolism has picked up. And by establishing a faster metabolism due to more movement of blood, we are able to move nutrients when they need to faster, we are able to get rid of toxins faster, and in that sense, it requires more energy. So all those uh, forms of stored fat that's around our muscle area, around our organs, the, the, the body will utilize those, those fats to improve on blood flow and thereby helping the individual to establish weight loss. Cool. Thanks, Donovan. Uh, we'll have time for one more question here. And before we get to this question, and actually, uh, I love this question, nice practical question someone asked. Before we get to that, Everyone to keep in mind, if you'd like to enroll on the Zest Wellness Program, that link, and that link is in the chat box of this webinar, it is joinzestwellness.com. That's joinzestwellness.com, all one word. And when you also go to these different social media links in our blog, you can see that this link is always posted. That's joinzestwellness.com to enroll in the program. So, Donovan, the final question for you is what do you recommend for cooking oils? Uh, for cooking oils? Yes. Suppose, uh, oh. like I said, but perhaps if someone's if someone's cooking dinner, what maybe what kind of oils they can uh, perhaps put in the frying pan? Okay. So um, that question is a bit tricky of a question for me to answer, uh, and I said that because I always try to encourage persons to choose things that they like. That's, that's very important because if you don't like it, then you're not going to make it a habit. And I know a lot of um, scientific studies or research or um, articles have come out and say, oh, only eat this type of oil, whether canola oil versus extra virgin oil or peanut oil or, or rice oil, these various sorts of oils. But in fact, we should be consuming vegetable oil. Let's just put that out there, okay? Vegetable oil is the better form of oil that we're consuming, whether you're cooking a meal or making a salad dressing. But the research also tells us that in terms of improving omega-3 consumption or improving heart health or to support heart health and weight loss, that we need to be eating, um, consuming oils that give us a great balance of omega-3 and omega-6. And scientifically proven, the extra virgin olive oil specifically extra virgin olive oil, not just generic olive oil or pomade. It has to be extra virgin olive oil or canola oil, which are very comparable in the um, quantity of omega-3 and omega-6. Those are the top oils you should be consuming. And I know as a nutritionist, a lot of persons tell me when they, they cook with extra virgin olive oil, 
they tend not to like the taste. I particularly don't um, sense a difference in the taste. But if you do sense a difference in the, t difference in the taste, then I encourage you uh, to use the extra virgin olive oil for um, non-cooking practices, meaning making salads or as a dressing or topping or as a dip, but use the canola oil for frying or baking. And that may help with the taste you you may be experiencing as well. Great, Donna. Thank you for those thorough answers. And thank you for everyone uh, tuning into the webinar. Once again, this is our join. This is our Zest Wellness webinar series. And a link to enroll in the program is joinzestwellness.com. One last time, Donovan, thank you for your time. Thank you, Nathan. All right. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, guys.